as far as the first question you had is about how is important is it a person to believe? Um, I've always preferred patients that don't believe in my medicine because I could figure I could get good feed, honest feedback from them. You know what I mean? Because I, one thing I don't like is a person that I give them remedies or I treat them and they say, oh, my whole life's changed, everything's better, I'm all well. No. I'd rather hear, you know, well, nothing's really happened. I said, well, how are your headaches? And they say, well, uh, well, actually, I don't have the headaches anymore, but uh, <laughs> do you know what I mean? I prefer an honest feedback and I prefer the critical mind. Some of the greatest homeopaths, one of the greatest homeopaths in America was a man named Constantine Herring, who was hired by the mainstream medicine, uh, mainstream medical people to debunk and finally criticize and sort of denounce homeopathy once and for all, finally, because homeopathy was taking over the medical profession in this country. And for those of you who don't know it, the AMA was founded in response to the movement of homeopathic medicine, which was known as the New School at that time. So the AMA was a group of people in the establishment who said, we've got to stop this New School. They're taking our, <laughs> they're taking our power away and our incomes, probably. We've got to stop this. So they formed an organization, and they call it the AMA, and it still exists today. But it was originally, and there's a book about that, which is interesting, that, that documents how they were founded in opposition to homeopathy. But Herring was uh, enlisted by those people to finally and firmly and completely denounce homeopathy. But he was this uh, Austrian who was very, very thorough in his approach to things. He said, well, if I'm going to denounce these people, I must know what it is I'm denouncing. So he began to study, and as he studied, he became ill, he had a, a wound in his arm, and it was infected, and his colleagues in the mainstream were ready to amputate his arm at one point because they couldn't get on top of the infection. And his homeopaths, the homeopaths he'd made friends with, came and said, no, 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 don't do it. Take arsenicum, take these remedies, and he was healed. And he became, you know, great, not only a great advocate, but a great teacher of homeopathy. So it works with people, I mean, horses, you know, uh, I mean, Traditional medicine, uh, yeah, I think if a person believes in things, that can make a lot of difference. Do you know, my teacher, one of his great medicines used to be, I'd see people come to him and they'd give him his complaints and they'd tell their problem. And, and he would say, well, do this and do this. And he'd give them a prescription. And then, and then bef at the final thing, he would say to them, he'd, say, he'd look at them and he'd say, you're going to be okay. And they'd go, Oh, yeah, thank you so much. And I, you could see oh, that moment. I, and I'd see that. I'd think, there's the medicine. <laughs> there is his medicine. But he said it with sincerity. He said it in truth from what he knew. And he said it so they could hear it. And it was medicine. And this is the same kind of thing that the mother supplies, you know, to kiss the child's Wounded part. How many of you know that? I mean, I do that to children when they, you know, they hit their head or hit some. You kiss it. I mean, hello, what is medicine but ministering to each other? This is the bottom line of what it's about anyway. So the idea that you have a disconnected physician. It used to be the doctor was like the family friend. Nowadays, medical ethics don't even allow it. Hardly, do you know? Or if you're a therapist, you can't become friends with one of your clients, do you know? So, yeah, belief is important. And belief is something that uh, not only is individual, it's cumulative and societal, I believe. I believe it's a field that's made up of belief that becomes really powerful. Rupert Sheldrake, anybody familiar with Rupert Sheldrake? Anybody else besides the energetic medicine people? <laughs> you know, in Australia, the, the, in their sharia, in their tradition, the executions were done by the one who was given the authority to execute. So if they broke the, their law, their sharia, their code of laws, they did believe in execution. But the execution was often carried out by one man who had in a bag a bone. And he would point the bone at the person. And that's all he needed to do. And they would die. And there's that story of the, of the man who in a battle, the Prophet Sallallahu threw a stone and hit him in the neck. And the, man, and the man said, he has killed me. And everyone, he just hit you with a stone. But in fact, the man died from that. So the energy 
is in belief. The energy is in uh, many, many things. There's, there's a subtle energy that, 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 that's by Allah's design. There's an energy that's created collectively that can be very powerful. I mean, there's a book by uh, Susan Sontag. Do anybody know Susan Sontag? She's a great writer, actually. She wrote a book called uh, Illness as Metaphor. And it's about how historically there have been these illnesses that have, in every age, in the modern age, she describes, tuberculosis was one in the, you know, in the uh, uh, 19th century. Tuberculosis, there was a time when tuberculosis was a, a really well-known social entity that had a social meaning and that it was artists and, and writers and very creative people that got it. And it was almost a kind of, there was a romantic ideal surrounding that there was a, and then cancer came as the kind of, you know, it's the thing with people whisper, he has cancer, he has cancer. And that, you know, she describes how that, the belief, the negative aspect of being pronounced as having cancer was a cancer in itself and was part of the illness. And now AIDS has taken the, you know, the new kind of role. And each one of them reflects not only, uh, it reflects something about the state of affairs of the society as well. It's a very beautiful, very interesting book that she wrote. And she wrote, she wrote an update of that book after AIDS. She wrote it with cancer as the last one. And then she wrote an update later, another version of it, a new edition with AIDS added to understanding the social implications. So, you know, I know many people who, have, uh, who are cancer victors. I used to belong to a group called the, the National Association of Cancer Victors and Friends, and I'm not even sure that it even exists anymore, but it used to exist, and it was an international association of cancer victors and friends, and what it was was simply a networking of people who had overcome cancer and their friends. And it really was a networking of people and included people in that organization who had overcome every single known kind of cancer. And it was a chance for someone who had that cancer to get in contact with another person who had had it and had victory over it. And um, I know people who have gone through uh, having had cancers and come out of it, and so many of them that I know personally, they said, well, first of all, I decided I was not going to buy into the mainstream. They say, how many, and I'm not saying this, I'm not recommending this, but I'm saying they said to me, they said, I did not go and have a biopsy because I felt that was the first stage of succumbing to the illness. My sister, who is what they call a women's advocate, she works with women on legal issues surrounding women's issues as an advocate, not as a lawyer, but as a, as a legal advisor. She says she believes she's had cancer many times, that it's come and gone. But she believes also that there's this fluid reality to it, and she doesn't buy into getting the biopsy, which is the first stage of coming to it, the first, the, going to the, to the lab, getting the lab results, which boom, has an impact. The doctors which say this and that about it, the reading about it, the whispering about it amongst your community and friends, et cetera, et cetera. The way in which your friends relate to you once they know it, the energy they come to you with, this is energy medicine too, or energy illness. I'm not saying to be unrealistic and I'm not advising anyone not to go by the mainstream medicine, but, but I'm saying we, we need to wake up to these realities of the unseen if we're going to go beyond them and find something greater.